privilege it is to read God's Word with you today. Um, please turn with me now in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Um, we'll be reading from chapter 6, verse 1. So that's the book of Romans in the New Testament, and we'll be reading from chapter 6, verse 1. Um, before we read, let's join together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today's baptism service. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to earth to live as man and to die victorious over sin and death so that we could claim his victory and live new lives being set free from sin. We pray that you will soften our hearts and humble us to remember this reality as we follow Christ daily. Please use Pastor Felix today as your mouthpiece and grant him wisdom and boldness to preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, CC, for the Bible reading, and uh, good morning and a warm welcome to everyone here today, particularly if you're visiting us or you're, it's your first time here. It's great to have you here to celebrate uh, this amazing baptism of our three candidates today. Well. We all love a good transformation story, don't we? Uh, my son Josh, he's three, and his favorite book for actually quite some time now has been The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Uh, you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this book. This caterpillar is born and then he eats more and more fruit uh, and then has a big binge on Saturday. And then something wonderful happens. One day he builds a cocoon and then bam, he becomes something completely different, something so unexpectedly beautiful, a butterfly. But it's not just in kids' stories, and even in Hollywood, even in our novels, uh, some of the most touching, impactful stories that affect us are those where there's a big transformation happening in our main character, whether it be Mr. Darcy, or even the superheroes. We, we want our superheroes to be not perfect, we want to see them grow to become a better person. See, we don't like static characters, do we? We want to see growth. We want to see character development. We like to see real, real change. And I think part of it is that the idea that there is hope in this world. We want to know that as we look around the world around us, as we see so much brokenness, so much personal weakness, so many challenges and obstacles that we face, we want to believe, we want to know that all these challenges can be overcome. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and today, as we witness the baptism of our three brothers and sisters, uh, Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe, we are celebrating a deep transformation of these guys. But what kind of transformation are we even talking about here? You might look at these guys and you might ask, why would they need to go through transformation anyway, right? These guys, they're all nice people. They're polite. They, I'm sure they do well at school, at uni. Uh, they're kind and conscientious. They're good. They're good people, law-abiding citizens of our country. They're good enough, right? But actually, God tells us that his standards are very different to ours. Because God has shown us through the Bible that he cares simply, more, more simply than our outward behavior. 
He cares more than just our outward contribution to society. He cares more than simply how nice we are to others, more than simply obeying the law. He cares about all these things. There's, there's no question about that. But there's actually something he cares about far more. Sorry. Thank you. It's my fault again. And what is this thing that God cares about far more than all these outward appearances? Well, it's how we treat God himself. And so listen to God's own assessment of every single one of us when we don't relate to God rightly. Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, that is, everyone, although we knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. It's pretty strong words there, right? But what is the fundamental issue with humanity? What is the most fundamental ish definition of sin? What the core of it? It's when we don't treat God rightly. It's not giving God the attention, the utter respect, the thanks, and the obedience that God deserves as God. Now, I read a blog written by a single mother of four who was venting her own anger and disappointment at her teenage son. I see one day her son pointed a finger at, at his mother and accused her of being slack, that she should find a real job so that they could afford more. But the most painful thing that she heard from her son was when her son shouted in her face, what have you ever done for me and the family? And so this is how the mom writes as she is <laughs> processing all this hurt and anger. She writes, I raised four children while working three in-home jobs to help support the family. I sacrificed a writing career because I was too busy wiping noses, changing diapers, breastfeeding babies at all hours of the night with minimal amounts of sleep. What have I done for my family? I cooked thousands of dinners, packed their school lunches, folded laundry, cleaned their home. I sat up all night with them when they had fevers and made sure that they had a roof over their heads. You can feel this mother's frustration, can't you? This son of hers was never for a moment grateful for the years of hard work, the sweat and the tears that she poured out for them. This son never acknowledged that he owed his health, his very existence, his life to his mom. Never thought about anything besides pleasing his own self and demanding that his mom work harder so that he could have a more comfortable life, so that he could have the stuff that he thinks would make him happy. And you know what? This is how every single one of us are when we choose to live our lives without God in the picture. When we live ignoring the fact that God made us, we happily take, we use and abuse the gifts that God has given us, but we never give thanks to him. And when challenges come up in our lives, we shake our fists at God saying, you must not exist. Or if you do exist, then you, you're not a very good God. How insulting is this to the God of the universe who gives us life, who sustains our very existence? And so can you guess what happens when those of us made by God, those of us, God has given us all the gifts that we enjoy so that we can live? What happens when we reject this God? Well, God gives us what we want. God lets us live without him. He lets us chase after our heart's desires when we chase after the things of this world that could never satisfy us. We chase after things that only give us momentary, fleeting pleasure, but ultimately leave us feeling empty. God lets us head out by ourselves into this broken world, trying to make up meaning and purpose for our lives as we reject the purpose given to us by God. Friends, this is what life looks like when we reject God. And ultimately, rejecting the life-giving God, that leads to death. 
And I'm not just talking about physical death here. I mean, that, that's one very obvious consequence of turning away from God. But more than that, spiritual death. That is, separation from God, our maker, being cut off from the relationship that we need, that we were made for, and being condemned, being punished by the God of the universe. So can you see why transformation is so necessary, even for the nicest people? Because here's the good news, though. This transformation that we so need, it isn't brought about by 40 weeks of hard effort, dieting and exercise. It isn't a hole that you need to dig yourself out of with your own bare hands. But the good news is that God freely gives us this transformation that we need. God sends his one and only son, his perfect son, Jesus. And Jesus, even though he, did, he does nothing wrong, though he was in the perfect, intimate relationship with God the Father, he willingly goes to the cross and dies. Why? Well, he does that trading places with us. Jesus experiences the death that we should have experienced as we rejected God. Jesus, dying on the cross, takes upon himself the punishment that we should have received. And he is ultimately buried in the tomb, cast out, forgotten, so that God's justice is poured out on his perfect son instead of us. And now he makes this forgiveness available to all of us who are guilty. And God says, if you trust in what my son has done for you, if you choose to follow Jesus from now on, if you will rely on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to be right before me, instead of trusting in your own effort, then you will be transformed. You will be restored to who you were meant to be, to be in right relationship with the life-giving God. And so what has all this got to do with baptism today? Well, baptism is that physical representation of what happens when someone puts their trust in Jesus. See, when Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe, they chose to look on the cross on which Jesus dies and says, yes, it should have been me. My sin should have put me hanging there on that cross. Yes, I believe that the perfect son of God took my sins upon himself and paid for my penalty, for my sins. Baptism physically represents what happens spiritually when, when they say that. Because when we trust in Jesus, we are united with Jesus. We say, we acknowledge that whatever Jesus has been through, that happens to us too. Where Jesus goes, we will go to. Our destinies are now intertwined, they're inseparable now. And so just as Jesus died and was buried, so too do these guys, have, ex have they experienced the same thing when they follow Jesus? This is what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? See, in a real sense, a part of them have died when they chose to follow Jesus. A part of them have died because they no longer live for themselves anymore. And that's what going under the water represents. Being buried deep with Christ. Spiritually, they now consider their old lives dead to them. But there's more than that. Because just as our members here today will come back up out of the water, that also links with the resurrection of Jesus. We, we actually sang about this uh, in our song this morning. Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with Christ him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. Because after Jesus died to take away our sins, he didn't stay dead. On the third day, Jesus resurrected to new life, proving that he had conquered sin. He had conquered death itself. And we too can share in that victory. And so just as Jesus was raised to new life, us coming out, out of the water represents our new resurrection with Jesus, our new life. So for those of us getting baptized, make sure you strike this pose as you come out of the water. Just kidding. Just kidding. 
But in baptism, we are witnessing that we are declaring, yes, these guys here today, their unity with Jesus means that one day they too will experience that resurrection into perfection, the perfected eternal life. But is that it? Well, it's not it. Because this resurrection isn't simply some future hope that we have. Because just as being buried with Jesus means that our old life is done away with now, those who follow Jesus also experience this new life already. Uh, Further on in Romans 6, if we keep reading, uh, Paul tells us that this current experience, uh, new life with Christ, means that we've switched sides. We've switched kingdoms, switched kings and masters. He tells us that we used to live under the kingdom of sin and death. That was what ruled us. But now, if you choose to follow Jesus, you are living under the master of God, doing the kingdom of righteousness right now. But more than that, we are a new creation because now that we have been clothed with Christ, he tells us there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, there is not neither male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. See, all previous markers of status, ethnicity, sex, wealth, none of that matters anymore. You are a new creation. Your identity is now purely found in your belonging, in being united with Jesus. And so this new identity, this new transfer into a new kingdom, you must have something to go to show for it, right? Because if all this is true, if all, all that I talked about, new kingdom, new identity, if that's true, then becoming a Christian isn't simply saying, I'll take that forgiveness, Jesus, thank you very much, and I'll continue to live however I want, just like I used to, right? This new way of seeing yourself, this new identity, drives us to live in a completely different way. Our attitudes change. Our behaviors are noticeably impacted for the better, right? We've begun moving towards being more like God in His righteousness and His holiness. Our lives are being transformed the moment we follow Jesus. And I suspect, for those of us who know our three baptism candidates, that this is something that you've already seen in them for some time now. Maybe a a change in the way they live. Not simply that they they just go to church more or do more churchy things, but what I mean is they relate to others differently. Maybe you've noticed more patience, more joy, more love. That's nothing less than the work of God in the lives of those who put their trust in Jesus and follow Jesus as king. Now, this doesn't mean they're perfect, (laughs) not by any stretch of the imagination, Uh, All of us who follow Jesus, myself included, will stumble, right? We will stuff up. And we will stuff up in big ways sometimes. And we will sin again and again against God and against others. We are not perfect. But when we look at the trajectory of the Christian life, we should be able to see growth and continual transformation. That is, over the course of months, years, decades even, we can look back and observe how far we've come by the grace of God. Because while baptism is a one-time event to declare that reality of being united with Christ, turning and choosing to follow Jesus isn't a one-time event. It happens day by day as we grow, as we keep committing ourselves to live for Jesus, to keep saying no to our old way of living for ourselves, but to keep saying yes to God. Day by day, we keep turning back to Jesus, back to his work on the cross. But this is what baptism means, and this is what we're witnessing today. It is that reality that our three friends here, Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe, the reality of their old lives being put to death, buried deep, that reality of being so intricately united with Jesus that Christ's death has become their death, and Christ's resurrection has become their resurrection. We get to witness the physical representation of that reality as they profess their faith and trust in Jesus and to live for him. How wonderful is that? 
And if you're here to, today with us and you want to find out more about this new life that we've been talking about, if you're curious after hearing a little about what following Jesus means, then we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to introduce to you to this Jesus who offers you this new life. And we'd love to answer any questions you might have about all of these things. If this is you, please come and chat with us afterwards, either myself or Pastor Iggy, uh, or your friend who brought you along. Uh, and we also love to have you to keep coming along to our Sunday services as well. Uh, at the same time, uh, every single Sunday. Uh, and next week, being Easter Sunday, would be the perfect time to come along to hear about how Jesus makes this new life possible. But as I close today, let me just address Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe. Guys, remember this day. Remember this day. Because, yes, we know that you've already chosen to follow Jesus. Some of you maybe a long time ago. But remember what today means. That you have been joined to Jesus. Remember your death to your old way of living buried deep under that water. Remember coming back up out of that water, representing your new life live for God. Remember that reality of being completely washed by Jesus' blood on the cross. Remember. But secondly, even today, as today marks a big milestone in your walk with Jesus, I want you to remember that following Jesus is a choice that you have to make again and again and again. That the commitment to live for Jesus happens day by day as you're faced with new temptations and distractions to tempt you away from living solely for God. Turning back to Jesus will happen day by day as you stumble. Keep coming to Jesus for your source of forgiveness and cleansing and for the power to overcome your sins. Let me pray to close. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these guys, Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe, for their faith in you and for uh, acting out in obedience uh, to be baptized today before all of us. And thank you for the reality of what this baptism symbolizes, what it represents of the inside spiritual work happening inside of them when they chose to follow Jesus. Thank you that Jesus died for our sins. Thank you that he rose up out of the water again into new life that we can now share if we follow Jesus. And Lord, will you be with Jeremiah, Jen, and Chloe that they might serve you and keep growing in you all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.